Can I can I have both our speaker on the screen, please? Dr. Bodri and Dr. Ranjan Shahu, please come on the screen. Uh, good morning, everyone. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Sorry, I had actually muted it. Okay. Yes, we'll start. The director, sir, can you come on screen? Yeah, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Basri and Mr. Narendran Chau and uh, Dr. Jagannath. Yeah, please. Good morning, sir. Yeah, we'll start. Monos, so we are ready with, we'll, we are going to start. Monos. <clears throat> Monos, so we are, we are ready with the, our social, yeah. He might have muted. Hmm. Yes, sir, you can start. You can start. Okay. Well, distinguished dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I am Dr. Jagannath Mollik, the coordinator of the lecture series and also moderator of today's lecture on international economic relations of the USA with India and China. First of all, on the behalf of State Bank Institute leadership, I warmly welcome our distinguished guest speakers, Dr. Badrinaran Gopalkrishnan from the University of Washington and Dr. Niranjan Sahu from Observer Research Foundation, New Delhi and other dignitaries and participants. About today's lecture, we know that how COVID-19 has hurt the global economy, including India, it has affected everyone. It could be rich, poor, the advanced economies, emerging economies, and the, among the sectors, it is manufacturing and services. So we are having first discussions on this issue, starting from our first lecture, that is on Japanese business or MNC in, in India in the pandemic by Professor uh, Sato from Kobe University, Japan. And then we discussed on the long-run economic growth in the pandemics in Russia, by the expert from Higher School of Economics, National Resource University, of Moscow, then on capacity utilization in Switzerland and India, on by the professor from K of Swiss Economic Institute, Switzerland, and then the expert from Reserve Bank of India, and then on the state of global economy in post pandemic by the professor from University of Groningen, Netherlands. So in this lecture, our focus was on demand side factors as the reason for the slowdown in economic growth in India and the other countries in this pandemic. We also focused on the supply side factors, particularly how the supply chain is disrupted due to this pandemic, which was uh, deliberated by, by the expert from the Institute of South Asian Studies in the National University of Singapore, and then on international economic system and world ordering by Professor Danny Kwa from the National University of Singapore. However, besides this COVID-19, there are many other things going on in the world, such as Brexit deal, establishment of RCEP, that is Regional Economic Comprehensive Economic Partnership, and changing political leadership in the most powerful countries like USA, and or shifting or relocating of the American and Japanese companies from China, then trade and tariff war of China with USA, Australia, India, and other countries. Recently, even after Brexit, the UK has formal applied to be the member of Asia Pacific, the trade bloc. Of course, some of international economic relations are also driven by the geopolitical relations. Considering this economic and geopolitical development in this <laughs> lecture, we'll yeah. have a uh, trade. Uh, yeah. Considering this economic and geopolitical development in this lecture, We'll have a detailed discussion by our guest speakers, Dr. Bradinaran Gopal Krishna, with a focus on international economic relations between USA, China, and India, and also political and strategic relations by Dr. Shahu. Friends, this is the seventh lecture of the series. For this, we are very thankful to our 
director mr sarj kumar potnaik sir for his active support for the lecture series the sequence of today's event as follows the opening remarks by our director and then followed by the presentation by both the speaker and then we'll have questions and answer session before i invite our director allow me to say few words about him he is general manager and director of sbl he is a law graduate from delhi university he has done his mba in hr and and is also a certified associate of the indian institute of banking and finance he has an illustrious career in banking about 33 years he is having varied experience in retail and hr as well as overall exposure to the bank's training system he has joined the sbi in 1987 as a professional officer he has served as chief manager learning and development regional manager circle development officer ahmedabad circle and dgm and badodara ahmedabad circle so i request you sir to deliver the opening remarks ever it's over to sir dear sir yeah thank you dr jagannath it's a awesome journey and uh, what should i say this is taken this there's a echo on it to mute his mic or something manoj take it away yeah i will put everyone's mic mute except the speaker yeah, yeah. good morning everyone the uh, at the outset i uh, will warm welcome from sbil to our distinguished guest dr badri narayan and dr niranjan sahu it's a privilege for us Okay, you have joined our platform, and as being a panelist, uh, you are going to take it forward. <clears throat> this international lecture series. This is definitely a, another empowering journey so far as the institute is concerned. At the same time, I welcome all the participants, those who are there. But at the outset, I must give a kudos to Dr. Jagannath. He has uh, stayed fastly during this COVID. He has taken his contacts, his relationship. is with knowledge partners so across the globe this institute of leadership have traveled whether it's japan whether it's russia whether it's switzerland whether it's singapore whether it's netherland we have traveled across for the relevant reasons and we have connected with the widest spectrum of the eminent people also and now to precisely what i want since this is an internal lecture series what my predominant in my mind is we are going to listen and they are the best in the areas in the domain so what i want to say is how i am going to promote my institute how i am going to place what what we are meant for in this regard we would like to tell you about our parent organization sbi regarding sbi with a legacy of 200 years is a leading financial service group of india with assets of 590 billion dollar SBI is ranked 236th in Fortune Global 500 list of world's biggest corporations. It has 22,141 branches, including 200 plus overseas branches in 32 countries. With its quarter million competent employees, SBI provides banking service to over 449 million customers across the globe. You take it out, 449 million customers who are dealing and. that means it is beyond so many countries populations also and three fourth of world countries population we can cross over this also training in the state bank is proactive planned continuous and integral part of organizational development and here we have there is a concept of training has also been gone to that level there are 51 state level state bank learning and development institutes spread across the country apart from that there are six apex training institute in this regard the state bank institute of leadership has been the new concept new thought process of our competent authority they have thought and it has been constituted in 2017 the basic idea is to go for the leadership management banking research but not confined to only sba and it has been targeted to the bfsi sector but in this pandemic and this corona it has gone beyond its boundary and because of that dr jagannath has come out the international lecture says beyond boundaries we have been targeting so many relevant issues if you are going to see during this uh, pandemic there are so many virtual uh, webinars we have gone through we have already crossed more than 50 regarding that 
10, 11 web, web series which we have placed in our YouTube and um, live streams, Facebook and all. There has been a participants of nearly more than 6 lakhs viewers for our web series. That means somewhere we are connecting our relevance with the issues and at the same time the, we are placing ourselves in the right domain. In this regard, I would like to share with this the topic international economic and strategic relation with, of the USA with India and China. This is a very interesting thing. And uh, the moment the discussion is going to uh, go on, I can assure, I assure that there will be a lot many takeaways. But at the outset, of course, I'll tell you, the relationship India and the USA is based on shared commitment of freedom, democratic principles, equal treatment of all citizens, human rights, and the rule of law. Now you think of whether all these things are exist with China. There is a trust deficit. No rule of law is there. There is a, what should I say? There is no democratic processes, principles, but in the global arena, these are the existence and these are the differences or nuances. With this, we are going to exist. In this regard, First, we'll talk about this. Uh, when Dr. Jagannath started, he started with the pandemic and all. But now my point is, pandemic, no pandemic. Economic, no economic or strategic relation. Whether this principle which I have shared with this, whether ultimately it is going to make a difference. So that has to be also we are expecting or something that is in our mind which we are sharing this. So far as the US and India trade relation is concerned, there is a long expected trade bill, which everyone was expecting during um, Mr. Trump's time, it could have been signed. But till now, it has yet to be materialized. Negotiation under prior administration on a bilateral investment treaty are stalled due to difference on approach on investor, investor protection. So many other issues are also there. Because so far as America and other European countries or developed countries are also having the opinion they are critical of India as well as China on the ground that these developing countries to claim special and differential treatment under WTO rules. They think they should not be given that kind of preference. That is also one of the expect. But at the, having said that, so far as this trade Indo-Pacific vision is concerned, India has opted out not to join RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership signed by China and 14 other countries. That is also during this in November 2020 in the midst of COVID. Still people are aligning with China so far as opening their markets to them. Because India had the concern about the effects of opening its market to China's export. After this border dispute with China, India and China is having a different ballgame altogether. India has stalled its business, it has reduced its uh, dealings with China, as well as so far as other issues are concerned, we are not in that some par parallels what used to have before the dispute is uh, concerned. Similarly, the United States withdraw from the proposed uh, TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership in 2017. And third is India also has sought to join Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation composed of United States, China, and 19 other economies, but his willingness to make sufficient economic reforms to join is still uncertain. So these are certain things we are definitely going to learn and to think about it. But so far as the strategic relation is concerned, after the change of American presidency, definitely it was a matter of concern, it will be a very strong word. It was a concern, it was an apprehension how the new dispensation of the 46th president uh, Mr. Biden is going to take it forward. But just day before yesterday, I came through the news. Indo-US to kick off major combat exercise in Rajasthan in next week. That means it is already there. Regarding what there is a very interesting message has come from the National Security Advisor Jack Sullivan. US will build on and carry forward the four-nation quad grouping in order to develop a new strategy to counter China's aggressive behavior in the Indo-Pacific regions. 
at the same time there is a very interesting thing is uh, there is a strong message from united states uh, secretary of state antony blinken to pakistan whether with indo china relation whether it will fit into it you are the two eminent personality you are going to share with this regarding the daniel paul terrorist those who have been given uh, what should i say they have been taken out from the prisons now they have asked pakistan with no uncertain term to explore all legal option to ensure that the killers of pearl are brought to justice and another very interesting point which i want to share is in the meantime china has launched its second most advanced warship for pakistan navy which can be fitted with nuclear arsenal also so so many things are getting to this because for china having pakistan arming them so they don't have to bleed the their own people they just have to find and uh, uh, to feed pakistan to the teeth so they can take advantage of this so this is a very interesting position so far strategic relationship is concerned uh, having relationship with india china and pakistan that is also going to be a game changer so far the strategic relation concern another thing which i would like to share with is after biden has mr biden has come into power what could be the relationship with iran that is also going to give a lot of changes because once the iran embargo is going to lift india's economy position or the chabar port which is still india wants to develop it that is also going to take a major step so far as india economy because the oil deal is a trade off for barter system india didn't have to pay in dollars it had to through uh, <coughs> commodities with the rice or other other things that was there but that has been stopped so that aspect has also been one of the major issues what is going to happen so iran and american relationship the strategic relationship so considering this india china and usa there are certain area like pakistan iran the relationship with taliban of usa all these things is also going to factor in all these things whatever layman or whatever the general we are going to know about it but after listening to you definitely will assure that yes you that we are going to take away for the more than what we are having this much from my side thank you very much to eminent personality mr dr badin naran and mr <clears throat> ranjan sahu at least you are you have come to our platform it's a privilege for us and thank you dr jagannath ke you have called this to eminent personnel to our board so all my best and we will be listening very uh, sincerely and will definitely take away whatever the outcome will be there thank you very much you are muted oh, sir thank you sir for the opening remarks really your remarks have set the tone for our distinguished speakers with this it is my great pleasure to invite dr bodinaran Gopalkrishnan to deliver the lecture about him. He is an affiliate faculty member and senior economist with School of Environment and Forestry Science, University of Washington, Seattle. He co-founded Infinite, some modeling LLC with offices in Canada, USA, India, China, Hong Kong, and other countries. He had also served Purdue University's Center for Global Trade Analysis and fellow at ICRIA. Indian Council for Research on International Economic Relations New Delhi His broad expertise lies in economic analysis for business strategy and public policy employing a variety of quantitative models with a list of publications in various international journals books reports and discussion papers he has been an independent consultant with several organizations including the mckinsey imf world bank un eu adb kpmg howard university and many other organizations he has presented his work in invited seminars in several places including howard university mit and across the globe in the world thank you dr bodinaran gopal krishnan for your valuable time so it's over to you Uh, thank you very much dr malik and thank you very much uh, uh, professor patnaik for the nice introduction uh, and nice uh, you know inaugural address uh, so i am very happy to be part of this uh, session and share uh, some of the findings uh, from some of my work uh, i also thank dr sahu for you know joining and adding his uh, perspective to the discussion so 
so uh, uh, right now we are in a very interesting uh, situation when it comes to international economic relations uh, so uh, for many years for many decades uh, us has been the uh, flag bearer of uh, free trade and uh, open economic policies free markets and so on and uh, as you all know china has been a, a communist country uh, although over the past 3 4, four decades they have uh, come up with many market reforms and they have this uh, combined approach they still have the communist party but they also have market based uh, systems uh, but uh, uh, last year uh, last not not only last year last you know 4 5 years we have seen a dramatic shift uh, in this uh, uh, scheme of things wherein uh, us has become uh, highly protectionist and uh, under the outgoing trump administration uh, currently you know uh, basically the former uh, president uh, donald trump and uh, basically his approach has been to was to uh, increase tariffs against many countries but particularly china and uh, and also increase other other barriers with respect to china and uh, china has also retaliated with the us uh, by increasing its tariffs and the uh, us has also increased tariffs with other countries including india with uh, for example india has lost the, the gsp status the generalized system of uh, uh, preferences so that uh, status has been lost by india which means that uh, in, in india also faces very high tariffs in the us market so in this in this way uh, us has become uh, more uh, protectionist than um, in the several uh, years uh, than it was in the past several years uh, and on the other hand china is taking uh, leadership in some of the trade agreements and like uh, 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 professor patnaik mentioned uh, rcep was the latest instance of that regional comprehensive economic partnership where uh it 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 was pretty much the case that china took the leadership and they set the tone for a lot of the negotiations there and india kind of missed the bus because we we could not uh, dominate the discussion so we india india had to come out of uh, that so the, uh, when, when all these things are happening uh, one uh, has a few questions but well, first question is uh Oh, oh, okay uh, you know it it makes sense we can understand uh, you know why all these things are happening uh, you know us is uh, us has become more uh, uh, protectionist and, uh, and and china is becoming the new leader of global trade uh, not only not only in terms of uh, 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 a player like an exporter and importer uh, but also Uh, as a trend setter or a, or a rule setter basically so to that extent you know china is emerging so now what is in store for india and how um, uh, how india's uh, response can be to to all these uh, developments uh, so uh, on this uh, i want to first um, discuss about the um, um, uh, the relationship between us and china Uh, uh particularly like i already told you uh, about what has happened in the past few years with the trump administration and uh, then i can talk a little bit about how uh, the new administration biden administration can you know change things a little bit and uh, and what is happening within china uh, broadly speaking and uh, uh, in in this context uh, uh, what are what are the trade policies of india in the recent years and uh how that can play with all these trends uh, so uh, around uh, another 5 10 minutes i'll talk more substantively more uh, qualitatively and then i'll show some numbers some analysis that i did uh, briefly uh so uh, in terms of us uh, uh, i already talked about the protectionist uh, steps in the recent past uh, with the new uh, incoming biden administration uh there have been at least two or three things that i uh, observed uh, recently the first thing is they are not going to be in a hurry to mend uh, relations with china because the uh, currently the the anti china sentiment is not only in india but also in us in fact uh, in us it's uh, even bigger um and and under and across the world it's it's there so 
we're not going to mess with that uh, part of it so that is going to stay uh, maybe there may be some uh, negotiation some um, uh, improvements in the ties and so on but but broadly speaking uh, china is going to be uh, you know stay us china relations are likely to be uh, pretty similar if anything uh, i think the biden administration may push for uh, some of the substantive issues like uh, intellectual property rights uh, you know enforcement in china which is not sufficient um or um, you know currency manipulation uh, some of these other other things non trade related things uh, they they might uh, you know talk a little more and uh, even one interesting thing that happened on the, on the last day of trump administration um, uh, the secretary of state uh, mike pompeo he uh, they they came with came up with a um, kind of a resolution and a declaration that uh, china has been committing genocide ag- against uyghurs and so on so that particular thing was important because i i i, I was observing that for the extent of continuity between the two administrations so the very next day or that uh, like two days later the new secretary of state uh, mentioned that that is going to stay we we also agree with the previous administration we may we may disagree with the previous administration on many things but with respect to china all the many of the things that was done uh, they they also agree because their 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 current priority for the biden administration is to uh, fix the covid situation because uh, as of now uh, covid is uh, still bad here in the us uh, so so they are going to focus on that uh, but uh, in that process this uh, relations with china and so on they are going to stay the same the status quo is going to be the same but the next few years what i imagine can happen is probably uh, the the phase one trade deal that uh, trump administration and uh, you know china uh, came up with last uh, last year uh, that might be uh, taken up and uh, more negotiations might be done by biden administration in the next next couple of years and uh, that may lead to some uh, improvements in the ties between us and china uh and and that can only happen if uh, china uh, agrees to some of the concerns by us about the way china operates and uh, that might mean uh, also good for other countries uh, if china can address some of these concerns so i think that is uh, what i i think can happen with respect to us china relations so but what i can take from this is broadly you know us and china are continuing they they're continuing to be um um you know uh, they 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 they're going to keep the same trade policy in terms of higher tariffs that that, that have been already uh, instituted so they're not going to go away any sooner so that is the first thing and secondly uh, also uh, many other countries have also been uh, talking about uh, uh, trade sanctions against china uh, particularly the quad countries um uh, quad group of countries Uh, uh which includes in australia japan uh and and also uh, uh, india is also part of that and and uh, there are also many other countries like israel uk uh, some of the other you know um uh, 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 uh countries in uh, asia and uh, the americas they are also interested in uh, uh doing some something like that they are uh, uh, coming up with some concerted efforts to counter china and particularly quad countries are pretty serious about it uh, i think this is more a subject of dr saho because it's more strategic and uh, uh, um um you know military kind of engagements but i think they also have some economic uh, ramifications for example um uh, you know japan uh, and a few other countries they uh, even australia some of these countries have been uh engaged in a lot of discussions with india uh, with you know niti ayog and other uh, institutions government institutions to uh, move some of their uh, uh, companies their uh, industries in china uh, to to india so there there has been some discussions along those lines so so what i'm saying is that uh, this uh, china visa with the rest of the world uh that uh, that is broadly happening that 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 those uh, tensions are happening with many countries uh, of course uh, like uh, uh, professor patnaik mentioned uh, our sub regional comprehensive economic partnership 
make sure that at least that block of countries are going to stay um, uh, friendly in an economic sense with china so basically rcep is also not a not a big not a huge agreement in the sense that it's not like uh, removing all the tariffs and so on so they also have a lot of exceptions so they have, all the countries have managed to protect their uh, sensitive sectors and uh, and the tariff reductions are uh, not that deep so in that in this in this uh, way uh, the the china visa vis rest of the world uh, is broadly something that is uh, happening currently so this is a, this is a global uh, situation now coming to india uh, uh, india has been um, moving uh, to uh, free trade uh, uh, kind of relatively uh, trade friendly policies over the past a uh, couple of decades but in the last uh, decade or so last you know 5 uh, to 10 years uh, the trend has been kind of reversed uh, uh, we we have been increasing some of our tariffs in india uh, uh, custom duties and uh, and that is actually uh, some of it is due to uh, our um, focus on Uh, uh you know uh, make in india to begin with to make sure that uh, the import competition is less and domestic uh, production becomes more viable and then uh, atmanirbhar bharat which is more about self reliance uh, but in all these cases the, the 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 ultimate purpose is to attract investment we we have a lot of investment in india and uh, then um, uh, what i imagine is that these tariffs are kind of temporary so we keep the tariffs high so that the companies if they want to sell to india uh, they uh, they cannot export from outside they have to come in and make in india or uh, develop the capacity in india and once they come once this becomes like a like a trend like a long term trend then the tariffs can be reduced again so this is i'm, I'm saying this because it has happened in the past uh, with the auto industry for example in indian automobile industry um, it has always had a pretty high tariff compared to many other sectors like i think it initially it was around uh, 200% of something and it came down slowly but not not a lot even now i, I if i uh, got it correctly it ranges between uh, 60 and 100% depending on which uh, can type of automobile you are talking about so because of that many of the pretty much all the major global auto companies they have a presence in india because they wanted to avoid the tariffs so they can enter india then the rail as india has a pretty good ecosystem for producing automobiles the mechanical engineering um, you know graduates uh, human uh, capital and uh, and also the other allied industries are uh, pretty widely present in india so they they started these industries and they are flourishing some of them for example hyundai plant in chennai uh, that is the largest uh, plant of hyundai which manufactures uh, small cars so so basically they came to make in india but they are exporting to across the world so in the same vein um, um, uh, when the prime minister talked about uh, atmanirbhar bharat i was listening to some of his speeches uh, for example the independence day speech last year uh, he mentioned that is atmanirbhar bharat is not uh, inward it's not inward looking it's more outward looking so we want to be self reliant but at the same time we have to uh, be like a hub for uh, global manufacturing value chains and so on so the broad vision is okay but uh, we have to see how uh, what kind of details what kind of policies are going to happen so uh, the budget uh, had some provisions but a uh, lot lot has to be done so i'm not going deeper into that but broadly i'm saying that um, india also has taken an inver- invert turn broadly speaking in trade policy and so now i, I think i have given a broad idea of what is happening in us china rest of the world and in india and now if you put all the pieces together you can think of uh, two kinds of uh, scenarios or situations in the future uh, one situation could be that uh, all the countries in the world may um, uh, uh, like not not all many many countries in the world are going to penalize china they're going to increase tariffs against china for various reasons the reasons may, may be many uh, one is like covid has uh, uh, you know kind of spoiled their image another thing is in general countries are losing uh, interest or uh, faith or trust in global value chains and when you talk about global value chains you cannot ignore china china is a big uh, fish there 
so if you don't want to rely on global value chain you want to be more inward looking uh, then china will be the first casualty so you are, you, are, you have to target china first so in that sense globally there is going to be like a, a tariff increase against china potentially and china will not keep quiet if that happens china will also increase tariff so that is the first uh, possibility the second possibility is that uh, uh, the all the countries in the world or many countries in the world they can ally with each other so like quad quad is becoming quad plus quad plus plus and so on so these groupings are going to be formed and la, uh, to a large extent they may also uh, kind of their 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 uh, target or objective can be to uh, economically uh, penalize china um, but they they may not do it directly uh, instead of uh, imposing tariffs on china they may just improve the trading relations among themselves and this is also something that is happening currently many countries are talking to each other and say okay let's uh, invest in each other let's export to each other uh, let's reduce our reliance on china and so on so this is also happening so now these two uh, things i uh, did a quick academic uh, simple exercise hypothetical exercise uh, using uh, using a global you know uh, supply chain economic model um and I, i will show you briefly some uh, visual uh, results uh, for next 5 minutes or so and then i will uh, close my uh, lecture uh, uh, i mean close my part and i'll come back again uh, i'm trying to share my uh, window uh, i think uh so uh, is my window visible or okay it is not okay um yeah yes okay can, can you see the bubbles Uh, yes yes yeah visible okay so so this is just to show the covid uh, situation so there have been uh, until like couple of days ago we have updated it so we see that uh, there have been 1.5 million deaths and 84 million confirmed cases if you see india uh, it's about 1/10 of the total deaths in the world are in india like 154000 and uh, in terms of confirmed cases uh, it's 1/8 Uh, like 10 million 10.7 million whereas in us uh, we just stopped counting actually there's so many so many you know deaths and uh, cases so almost one third of the cases and uh, um, one almost one third of the deaths also uh, and brazil is also pretty big so in the uh, uh, in the initial initial times uh, china was big and others were small and over time this is what has happened so de- definitely covid is a big uh, big issue so now uh, uh, going uh, beyond uh, covid so uh, okay uh, i think there is some technical issue not able to navigate I think um, there's some issue, but I I will uh, just talk about the results. I want to show the visual uh, details, but I can just uh, talk verbally. So the 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 analysis I did was to look at uh, two different uh, uh, scenarios. Uh, one, as I mentioned, all countries raise tariffs against China, and China also reciprocates. And second is where uh, all countries uh, reduce tariffs against each other. and uh, leave china alone they don't do anything with china china is just isolated uh, but it is not uh, it's not going to suffer from increased tariffs or something so uh, in these two scenarios what we found was uh, i looked at the next few years i looked at the next 5 uh, years what's going to happen from 2021 to 
uh, broadly speaking, the results suggested that um, India um, is uh, going to in India could potentially gain a little bit in both cases. Uh, um, even even when uh, all the countries uh, penalize China uh, directly by increasing tariffs against China, uh, India can uh, benefit from it, um, and it, India's GDP could be uh, slightly uh, higher than otherwise uh, because of that uh, scenario. Uh, and that is because of few reasons. First reason is that uh, when uh, countries are uh, penalizing China. Uh, the trade is diverted away from China towards India. Uh, so countries that are importing from China, they're going to import more from India. But not only India. Uh, if you take the the US-China trade war that happened a couple of years ago, I mean, that is still happening, but a couple of years ago it started. Uh, many people expected that a lot of uh, trade, uh, uh, the exports from China would go down and that would get shifted to India, exports from India. But that did not happen in a big way. It happened only to some extent. And that's because the Southeast Asian countries like Vietnam, um, even the smaller countries like um, Brunei um, and, and Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, many of those countries, they picked up on a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, industries where uh, China suffered uh, a blow from US. Partly because China is also well connected with those countries. So many Chinese companies, they, they could establish their uh, presence in these countries. And uh, Chinese countries are expo continuing to export from uh, these countries, kind of like what we call as re-exports. Um, so in that sense, India did not have, uh, did, was not able to uh, take advantage of that opportunity. Uh, in the same way, uh, even with this uh, situation that, that we I discussed now, India is not able to uh, exploit it much, but there is a small uh, increase. I think I found something like uh, around 0.1% uh, increase in GDP uh, that can come from the world penalizing uh, China. So that is uh, one aspect. The second uh, scenario where the, there is a global cooperation, all the countries reduce tariffs against each other. They you know, promote more free trade among themselves uh, and China, is left out of that free trade. Uh, in this situation, what I found is that India can gain uh, a little more. Uh, I think that was around uh, zero point, uh, like around quarter percentage, like 0.25 percent increase in GDP can come in this regard. Uh, so this is the you know the broad uh, economic impact that I I could uh, analyze by looking at different scenarios of how uh, US-China and the rest of the world-China relations can pan out in the next few years. So the, the inference I got from this analysis is that uh, to, 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 there are two broad inferences. One is uh, India can gain uh, more if India can cooperate with the rest of the world um, by you know, reducing tariffs and so on. Uh, secondly, um, also what I found is that, uh, yeah, obviously, when I say the first thing, I, I also mean to say that um, the, you know, directly, uh, you know, uh, increasing tariffs against against China may not be that beneficial for India. So it's better to cooperate with other countries rather than directly increasing tariffs against China. And uh, uh, currently, our trade policy is also not doing that. Indian government is not actually increasing tariffs against China. It, it's only doing other things like banning the apps from China. Uh, restricting FDI from China, and you know that also in an indirect diplomatic way, but that is uh, not something we are talking about. I'm talking about the tariff increases. So tariff increases are not happening so far, at least not in a big way, at least not in a way that US did for China. Uh, so uh, what I feel is like the current uh, uh, approach is fine, but then there is also there is also a need for forging economic partnerships with many other countries. Uh, so if we cannot do that, then uh, we may be, uh, uh, you know, our, uh, we may be going through our baseline and the baseline is going uh, down and down now because of the, the COVID pandemic. Uh, we have already lost a lot of uh, economic activities this year. And um, uh, the, there, is, there, there is an expectation that we can bounce back, but that bouncing back can be sustained and strong only if we can, uh, only if we can complement that by 
uh, stronger uh, uh, economic relationships globally. And in this context, U.S.-India relationship is also of uh, paramount importance. Uh, and, and, and similarly with uh, other uh, friendly countries like uh, you know, UK, uh, you know, Japan for sure, and Australia, New Zealand and so on. Uh, uh, so, for example, the RCEP, uh, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, we have you know, good uh, relations with all the countries there except uh, China. So that good relation, good political diplomatic relations can then blossom into economic relations also. So we can have uh, uh, you know, uh, more liberal trade policies with respect to other RCEP countries. In that sense, we can combat the damage that we might uh, get uh, because of the grouping, uh, you know, the, the, the agglomeration effect or the grouping effect of RCEP, uh, which is in which uh, China could be the main beneficiary and India can lose at that cost. So, uh, so that's a broad um, set of things I want to discuss. So just to summarize a few points, the first point is that yeah, the, the globally there has been an increased move towards protectionism and India is not an exception to that trend. Uh, whereas China is taking a leadership in trade to some extent, and uh, but then th there is also because of COVID that situation has changed a little bit, wherein China is being uh, not seen very favorably by by many countries. In this situation, India can potentially gain uh, by forging economic relationships across the world, uh, particularly with US and uh, some of the other Western countries, and also countries like Japan and Australia and so on. Um, and, and rather than uh, kind of a combative approach where we increase uh, tariff against uh, China. So I uh, uh, take, uh, I, I end my uh, discussion for now here and I'll answer questions after some time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gopal Krishnan, for the interesting and insightful presentation on international economic relation of USA with India and China, and particularly sharing your research results on the estimation of, of the tariff model, very high, how India could be, can gain from this tariff reductions. With this, it is my great pleasure to invite Dr. Shahu to deliver the lecture. About him, he is a senior fellow at Observer Research Foundation, a leading think tank in New Delhi, with 19 years of expertise in governance and public policy. <coughs> Sorry, he now leads studies and programs on governance, democracy, electoral reform, conflict, and human rights. He is a recipient of Ford Asia Fellowship and also Saratan Tata Fellow. Dr. Sahu currently serves as a member for the Carnage Rising Democracies Network, Washington. He serves a regional democracy expert advisor to Freedom House in USA and Asia Democracy Resource Network, South Korea, Seoul. He has published a list of papers in international journals, books, reports, and discussion papers in his credit. His first book is on Funding India's Democracy by Rockledge London. His work on polarization in India, titled Hindu Nationalism and Rising Political Polarization in India, was recently published by the Brookings Press USA. So thank you, Dr. Shaw, for giving your valuable times. It's over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Jagannath, and uh, 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 Dr. Badri also uh, illustrating the trade aspects, and uh, and I uh, <clears throat> also uh, uh, express my uh, gratitude to the director uh, uh, laying out the uh, pathway for us to you know <clears throat> continue our uh, discussion. I think uh, he uh, uh, made a broad agenda. Am I audible? Yes, 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 you're audible. Okay. Uh, so, so, so it makes my uh, job a little more easier. But my problem is that uh, uh, the topic I'll be speaking is too broad and uh, it covers so many things. So which is not possible uh, in a uh, 25 uh, upon hour uh, uh, kind of uh, presentation. So I'll try to uh, run uh, a few slides quickly uh, because uh, this would at least give uh, our participant you know some idea what's uh, happening between us uh, india and uh, china uh, it's like a triangular uh, kind of you know relations uh, and uh, probably uh, 21st century uh, is going to be shaped by these three countries uh, in many ways uh, in fact uh, 
no country uh, no continent in this world is not going to <clears throat> remain uh, you know untouched by these three uh, powers uh, and, uh, and and uh, and uh, whether it's trade whether it's uh, geopolitics whether it's climate change you name any initiative including the security i think these three uh, three countries are going to be the key players of course us has been the key player for uh, last seven decades and uh, china is increasingly uh, putting it a bit, but India is uh, also not lacking in terms of initiative and ambition. It's also catching up. So, uh, so it's an interesting kind of, uh, uh, you know, sort of triangular relationship. Uh, and I really compliment for picking up this topic because uh, this is uh, currently, in fact, uh, it's, it's a major discussion point in India, especially with our border class with China since May, last May. So there's been in the strategic uh, foreign affairs circle, the, there's a lot of discussion on this particular aspect, especially the kind of relationship that is uh, mushrooming between United States and India uh, vis-a-vis China. So, so in this context, this uh, discussion would add a certain value. Uh, <clears throat> so let me uh, run the slide. Okay. Is the presentation visible? Yes, yes. Yeah, visible. Okay. It's visible, yeah. Thanks. <clears throat> okay. You can, you, uh, you can put it in repeat in mode. In PowerPoint mode. Otherwise, it's, it okay. it's okay now? Yeah, okay, please continue. Yes. Okay, okay, thanks. <clears throat> so, it's uh, 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 to run a quick snapshot of uh, first the US India relations. Uh, let me start that, you know, the relationship goes much, uh, <clears throat> much, much, uh, you know, earlier, uh, like the, during the British Raj. In fact, when India was uh, 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 especially the Indian National Congress and, you know, many leaders uh, were actually trying to uh, free India from the British Raj. Uh, it was United States which uh, gave very critical support uh, during that time. And in fact, uh, it's, uh, it's very well documented how President Roosevelt uh, during the Second World War exerted a lot of pressure on British Prime Minister Winston Churchill to uh, give independence to India because uh, uh, this was what actually uh, Roosevelt thought uh, that India can be a rising power in Asia and uh, and it as a large country deserves actually full independence. But Churchill resisted of course. Uh, Post-independence, uh, uh, the relationship began very cordially. In fact, uh, the Kennedy, the John F. Kennedy administration was very keen to uh, make India as a, a sort of uh, Asia ally uh, in, in, in the fight against uh, the rising communism, especially the Soviet Russia and uh, China. Uh, so, so in a sense, uh, he wanted actually uh, India to be an ally and he was very fond of Mahatma Gandhi uh, principles of you know, non-violence and many things. And he was also very fond of uh, Jawaharlal Nehru, our first uh, prime minister. But unfortunately, because of the Cold War uh, settings and in which uh, uh, Pakistan, which, you know, <clears throat> emerged as a separate country from India, uh, became uh, very quickly, took the initiative and became very close uh, sort of ally of uh, United States. And, uh, and of course, India's own policy of uh, uh, non-alignment, which was pursued uh, largely by uh, India and many other countries uh, in Asia and Africa after who actually got... Uh, you know, freedom from the colonialism. Uh, they thought that they will chart out an independent course. So that non-alignment policy actually made us made us actually uh, kind of uh, in many way, uh, you know, uh, the Western power look look us uh, uh, at very suspiciously, and that actually led to gradually, you know, we be becoming a sort of a distant kind of you know uh, 
uh, <clears throat> nation from this Western islands, especially UK, US, uh, Germany, and you know many European countries, which became a sort of block against the uh, Soviet uh, uh, Russia. Uh, so as I said, uh, that our arc rival uh, Pakistan actually uh, tried and you know ensured that uh, India remains uh, away from the Western bloc and. Uh, and Pakistan joined many of those Western uh, uh, security and uh, defense uh, 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 sort of alliances, uh, and, uh, and 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 our non-alignment policy in many way actually kept us uh, away from the Western bloc, and uh, and we were largely seen as a sort of uh, uh, you know siding with uh, Soviet uh, Russia, uh, and uh, and US especially became very suspicious uh, when. We had, uh, uh, especially the uh, Richard Nixon became the president uh, in the 70s. Uh, so in terms of uh, like uh, first bilateral kind of relationship, uh, Eisenhower was the first uh, president to visit India in 1959. And uh, in, in fact, when we had war actually in 1962 uh, with China, and we were desperately looking for, you know, internal support because uh, China attacked suddenly and uh, then we were not really prepared. And uh, that point, we didn't have much uh, sort of uh, military strength. So Nehru actually frantically, in fact, uh, you know, made uh, calls to uh, Kennedy administration and Kennedy, uh, you know, with a uh, uh, bit of reluctance uh, supplied, you know, arms and that actually... Uh, opened some kind of, uh, uh, you know, vista for a sort of new relationship. But then, unfortunately, uh, uh, India had wars with, you know, Pakistan in 65 and 71. And by then, Pakistan was a very close ally of uh, America. So that actually strained the relationship. And because U.S. openly supported Pakistan, uh, especially in the 1971 war uh, over, you know, creation of Bangladesh. And that actually, uh, really, for next two decades, that actually spoiled the relationship and it uh, uh, strained the uh, US-India relationship uh, to a, a great extent. Uh, and uh, high point of, you know, worsening US-India relationship was uh, the Washington Peking and Islamabad, you know, axis which was formed in the 70s, especially when uh, Kissinger, you know, uh, brought uh, a sort of uh, kind of, uh, you know, China to the table. And that actually led uh, sort of uh, worsening of, you know, relationship with the United States. Uh, uh, then, uh, uh, you know, after a bad phase of almost for 40 years, uh, the real opening came after 1989 when uh, Soviet Union collapsed and uh, Cold War formally ended and the Western powers, especially United States, declared that, you know, they have won the first battle against the Cold War and, 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 and you know, people like uh, Francis Fukuyama wrote about end of ideology, end of, you know, history and several, you know, yeah, that, you know, ultimately the liberal ideology has won over the communism. So that was actually a time when uh, America started looking at India in a different, uh, from a different lens because uh, India by then had become a successful democracy and uh, the largest democracy in the world. So Clinton administration, especially, uh, uh, and that time we had Bajpi, you know, government, uh, right wing uh, government, uh, first time uh, a no, full fledged non Congress government uh, which stayed uh, uh, for five years in power. So 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 Bajpi and Clinton, they actually gelled very well, and uh, and then there was a beginning of you know kind of a, a sort of a improvement in the relationship. Uh, and uh, that was also time when United States recognized India as a rising economic power because we had opened our economy in the 1991 and uh, e e e India with you know, its large population was also uh, becoming a major sort of market. Uh, so US also was looking from that aspect. Uh, uh, but then Pokhran nuclear test in 1998 actually created a you know, kind of a temporary hurdle and uh, in fact US had put sanction. But then uh, the George Bush administration uh, in 2005 actually was quickly, you know, it removed those sanctions and other thing and went for a, a very, very transformative kind of, you know, civil nuclear deal in 2005. And this this actually led the real path for India-US cooperation and uh, massive transformation in the relationship. So, so 2005 is, is a, I would say, is a kind of, you know, uh, uh, sort of a defining moment and that civil nuclear deal because 
uh, for all these decades india uh, us never recognized india as a nuclear power and uh, it never allowed divin any kind of you know enriching fuel and you know nuclear uh, any kind of uh, technology uh, related to it so this was actually a major uh, sort of uh, improvement and then uh, this was also the time when america uh, had a lot of troubles also in afghanistan iraq and you know because of its war uh, over terrorism especially after 911 crisis uh, so so the uh, america was uh, gradually you know uh, identifying that pakistan is playing the double game and uh, and that was the time when america thought uh, that uh, there is no point in actually putting all the eggs in one basket of china uh, so pakistan so look at uh, india in a more positive light so that is where the relationship started building up and especially during bajpayee's time uh, he actually went further and you know made uh, several kind of a uh, 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 gesture uh, to us uh, in terms of you know uh, increasing cooperation democracy because india and us uh, together they set up several democratic global democratic institutions like un democracy uh, fund uh, communities of democracy so many institutions were created by india us support and then uh, that was also time when us uh, pushed india to become a, a you know member of that nsc nuclear supplier groups this is a very prestigious club and india was never you know allowed any kind of a, uh, sort of access to this so this was also another turning point and uh, and then this is also period that marked kind of you know expanding defense and security cooperation between these two countries uh, modi government uh, uh, actually uh, you know built on what actually uh, uh, manmohan singh you know in 10 years did uh, especially starting with the civil nuclear deal in 2005 in which uh, the manmohan singh government had to face uh, you know a major problem because the left parties opposed it and you know they pulled out from the government so government had almost uh, come to the collapse but you know it survived so 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 manmohan singh led lot of actually you know a sort of a ground for the uh, depending of the relationship but uh, modi when he came to power in 2014 despite you know modi facing a lot of uh, problem from the us especially uh, when he was the chief minister and gujarat uh, in- incident happened riots happened so after that us had actually put a sort of uh, uh, restriction on his you know travel to U- united states but you know obama administ- uh, uh, administration was quick to remove that and invite him to the us and he uh, uh, modi as a pragmatic uh, he he actually uh, took he didn't hesitate and he went in the very fast chance as soon as he got elected he immediately went to the us in 2014 and he made two trips actually in uh, 2014 and made several road show you know those big uh, uh, meetings actually in which lot of indian nris uh, you know came and all that actually created lot of actually interest within us circle about india's rise and obama visit Uh, visited also in 2015 as chief guest of you know republic day that was also uh, as a sign of you know affirmation that uh, relationship is really improving and uh, and 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 one of the you know as a uh, uh, sort of outcome of this sort of uh, uh, you know uh, flexibility and you know greater trust in the relationship uh, us india they signed the defense framework agreement in 2015 this is a major uh, you know sort of uh, uh, treaty because india had never signed and before that india was all the time telling you know to the world that it is uh, following a non alignment policy and it won't actually go with uh, defense agreement with any power for that matter uh, so so then uh, Um, india became a major defense partner and this is a major uh, uh, development because uh, uh, by signing that actually united states for the first time has given this sort of uh, you know uh, kind of coveted uh, uh, position to a non nato ally you know that northern uh, uh, <clears throat> treaty alliance uh, partners who actually become us you know kind of a course uh, sort of uh, allies enjoy you know that sort of uh, uh, defense uh, support uh, like you know japan korea philippines many countries in europe they enjoy that sort of aim. so india is the only non nato ally to have you know uh, this sort of uh, become a defense partner of united states and then uh, we have actually signed several treaties and especially with the trump administration he has gone aggressive and signed uh, uh, several thing including the uh, comcasa which actually provides india uh, technology access you know all these decades in us never actually allowed india to access its most advanced you know military technology but uh, but after signing this agreement india is able to access some of the most critical technology which only us you know shares with its allies 
and that's that's a uh, you know major improvement and then we have basic exchange cooperation agreement beka which was signed uh, during trump administration uh, and this actually allows uh, india Uh, uh, to use even US military equipment and you know even fleet uh, against any power. Uh, so so in a sense, this signals that there is a massive improvement between these two countries. And I think uh, uh, it's unbelievable, you know, 20 years back that uh, one would see that US India relationship would actually reach this stage uh, where uh, that India relationship with US has become a kind of bilateral consensus between Republican and, and uh, Democrats in United States. now coming to uh, the china uh, thing uh, the uh, the real uh, i would say the elephant in the room uh, between us uh, and uh, india uh, relations uh, the china is actually is the major factor so uh, us china relationship uh, uh, is uh, uh, you know i'll just uh, run a few slides uh, just to show how it has actually the entire trajectory since 1950s has continued and where does it stand today it has largely gone uh, you know from conflict to cooperation from cooperation to non conflict so it started uh, you know in the 50s uh, basically uh, with a stormy you know kind of note uh, in which uh, you know when uh, the, the communist uh, revolted uh, and captured the power in china in uh, uh, 1949 and mao zedong became the chairman and he became the you know ruler of the uh, the new uh, country called people's republic of china so that was the time when us opposed that because uh, us was apprehensive already about the soviet russia and then it saw that another rising communist country is going to be a real challenge for its dominance and in terms of a threat to the liberalism so us uh, largely during that time back the nationalists you know who are fighting against this communist uh, chang sai ke and who actually exiled to the taipei uh, today what is called taiwan and uh, in fact uh, us actually tried to do everything to protect the integrity and uh, you know security of the taiwan and it continues till date Uh, then i think the relationship further worsened between china and us uh, during the korean wars in the 1950s in which uh, north korea uh, south korea you know they fought uh, and the country split uh, between based on ideology and north korea became china's puppet and us supported south korea uh, so then we had actually seen uh, you know uh, tibetan uprising in 1950s late 50s in which india became in fact uh, part of it and ultimately that led to the war so dalai lama flees to india and then us condemns uh, the china's uh, you know sort of suppression of uh, uh, tibetan uh, um, sort of uh, you know demand of uh, becoming a separate uh, you know country and maintaining their sovereignty and then uh, the china's atomic test in 1964 for the strain because us became much more suspicious however the, the, there was a thaw in the uh, relationship frost relationship uh, which largely happened in the uh, you know late 60s and that actually happened largely because of the rise of soviet russia and uh, and soviet russia uh, china relationship also uh, strained uh, during that you know this particular period 60s and 70s in which uh, uh, they had uh, you know war and you know, and uh, soviet russia occupied some of the you know territory of china so that led to a big sort of uh, you know um, sort of uh, it created an opening for the us to enter and uh, probably you know in some way or other create a detent uh, between these two countries and uh, ultimately get china uh, to checkmate russia so so if you look at uh, this was the period uh, which saw actually the relationship uh, uh, gradually improving and sino, uh, as i said sino, sino uh, the china and soviet split which happened uh, provided a kind of opening for the united states and uh, the baby step was you know that uh, especially richard nixon uh, who was the president he sent uh, his uh, uh, you know secretary of state uh, henry kissinger to you know warm up with china uh, and especially with mao and then then create a opening uh, so ultimately uh, first time in their uh, entire history of you know 30 years uh, it happened that uh, uh, which is called ping pong dip- uh, diplomacy in the uh, international relations uh, so a team of us uh, uh, diplomats and you know several other experts visited us and uh, ultimately uh, that actually led to sort of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, the preparation for the future meetings 
and then finally nixon goes to china in 1972 he spends two weeks uh, you know kind of in china uh, just to warm up uh, with uh, the chinese rulers and uh, and ensure that you know both countries are actually uh, together uh, against the soviet uh, threats Uh, so this 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 became a me- mega event and uh, everywhere the you know journalist and uh, press followed uh, kessinger and uh, and and, uh, and it created generated lot of interest in especially in america and the west uh, then uh, uh, in 1979 us established uh, formal relationship with uh, china after uh, that famous uh, you know kessinger led uh, peking washington islamabad deal uh, happened in 1978 and us ended its official ties uh, with uh, you know taiwan and uh, uh, confirmed uh, one china policy this was a major major uh, sort of uh, uh, climb down from the us because till then us was saying that you know taiwan is a separate country but uh, first time it said uh, you know that uh, taiwan uh, would be a part of you know china at some point Uh, although taiwan denounced uh, it had no alternative because it depended on us uh, you know security uh, to survive uh, so the major outcome of this uh, sort of uh, development is that you know united states open the trade relationship uh, you know uh, between these two country open and then uh, uh, china actually uh, also started accessing uh, not only capital uh, it also access technology uh, investment and a lot of things from united states and major uh, benefit that china gained out of this you know sort of uh, close relationship with the united states is that it gained the access with japan because till then japan uh, had uh, not actually opened any kind of access with china and their, their relationship had, was very frosty after you know especially the second world war and you know in which uh, uh, japan was seen as a sort of aggressor uh, so 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 japan's relationship also normalized and this was a key uh, point uh, of uh, you know uh, sort of benefits for china because uh, china massively benefited in terms of japanese technology and investment and uh, and in, in fact china's rise economic rise actually facilitated by japanese you know investment japan korea uh, taiwan hong kong they uh, massively invested in you know uh, in china mainland Uh, then uh, us also allowed uh, china's entry into uh, wto uh, and this actually allowed china to become a global uh, economic power because uh, for so many years uh, us didn't actually allow china to enter wto so 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 uh, improvement of relationship uh, between these two countries you know in many way benefited china actually although strategically us benefited to keep you know uh, to corner uh, soviet uh, russia but china really uh, you know typical going by the uh, what uh, deng xiaoping said that you know we have to uh, bide our time and you know hide our strength and and he basically followed uh, you know this sort of policies uh, and accept whatever us is telling as long as they are able to benefit economically the development in recent uh, decades is basically uh, you know you have see uh, the uh, the real actually uh, problem started since 2009 uh, i would say it's like you know period which set a kind of you know conflictual relationship uh, between us and china uh, china becomes uh, us biggest creditor and that created lot of problem you know which uh, uh, my previous uh, presenter uh, um, uh, dr badri knows very well so china becomes us biggest creditor and it has purchased so much of you know bonds and other thing uh, from from us uh, and uh, in many way us actually uh, faces lot of trouble actually because of that and china becomes also second largest economy uh, uh, in 2010 and that actually also led to uh, you know lot of uh, hard burning in us and you know western uh, because they didn't imagine that uh, this will happen so soon Uh, and then uh, what actually really created the trouble is that china also massively started expanding its you know military uh, capacity mo- military modernization you know developing uh, infrastructure uh, which is uh, in many way threatening to the neighbors you know japan vietnam including india and this actually raised lot of suspicions because before that china was not really bothered about this thing it was more bothered about its you know economic modernization and you know sort of uh, expanding its uh, uh, sort of uh, governance and other footprints but gradually with you know economic power, mighty it started also expanding its which is a logical flow uh, us begins uh, much more you know greater attention about china's intention over south china sea you know south china sea is a sort of big, big dispute uh, and there are five to six countries in southeast asia who, which are claimants you know philippines vietnam indonesia several countries uh, claim that you know south china sea is actually their uh, sort of uh, space where they can do the navigation and uh, exploration
Western. But uh, uh, you know, gradually, China has encroached and you know has created the even military uh, sort of barrier there, and uh, it has it has taken you know uh, done uh, uh, pretty gone nasty with you know Philippines and Vietnam over South China Sea, and then there was a dispute between Philippines and uh, China over the South China Sea, uh, you know, uh, and then uh, Philippines owned that in the international you know tribunal, but China actually didn't accept that. And that created a real problem because if China won't actually accept the rule of law, then uh, if uh, at this point if it becomes even bigger power, then it will actually create its own laws, and and that and that that is where actually US, Japan, uh, even European Union, many countries including India also they felt that China's intentions are very different, and it is not going to follow any international law norms and you know values. Uh, 2012, you know, based on that, uh, that is where actually. Uh, you know, America started, uh, you know, beginning to apprehend uh, China's intention, and then uh, we also saw the beginning of the trade disputes, uh, uh, and Beijing becoming much more assertive with, you know, Japan, Vietnam, Philippines, many other countries, and that set actually uh, the tone for uh, next U.S. administrations, you know, sort of uh, uh, much more vocal and, you know, clear stand against China. And what you saw in last four years of, you know, Trump administration is basically a follow-up. And then what actually we are actually witnessing uh, it's sort of much more serious concern is basically the rise of you know the new leader uh, China's uh, uh, president Xi Jinping. Uh, be before uh, Xi Jinping, uh, what we had actually is that you know most of the Chinese uh, presidents actually uh, played a very sort of uh, uh, you know uh, I would say subtle you know unassuming uh, non-threatening kind of way. But once uh, uh, the new leader uh, comes in 2012 and 13. He actually uh, starts uh, charting out China's hegemonic ambition in the regions, and you could easily see that uh, that uh, you know sort of stamp uh, is carried in BRI, you know that Belt Road Initiative, in which you know it becomes one of the largest geopolitical uh, kind of you know infrastructure projects. Uh, it almost touches five continents, and uh, and you know funded largely by the Chinese state. Uh, uh, with a clear intention of you know dominance and you know uh, benefits uh, both trade and uh, in terms of you know strategic uh, uh, advantages and then it also created institutions like BRICS East Asia Summit and several other where you know China wants to create alternative global institutions uh, so that you know it will set the tone like the United States uh, did in the uh, 40s and 50s. Uh, then it has become very assertive over Taiwan, Hong Kong, and South China Sea. Taiwan, uh, you know, it has several classes, and on many occasions it has actually, uh, you know, uh, um, hounded uh, Taiwan politicians and journalists. Hong Kong, it is actually completely violating the agreement it has signed with UK and imprisoning, you know, a lot of uh, uh, democracy uh, protesters. Then you have also uh, seeing the you know authoritarian charms. It's spreading over many countries where actually it openly supports uh, you know rogue regimes like in Cambodia, you Thailand, and uh, many part of Africa. Uh, so this is also creating a rising an U.S. anxiety. Uh, and uh, what we also witnessed during uh, you know this Corona pandemic virus is also uh, clearly you can see China is actually uh, sort of a scant regard for the international norms and you know principles by not allowing you know any kind of independent uh, uh, sort of expert to go and verify the origin of the uh, this particular you know uh, virus and it took almost one year for who team to you know visit china and they have just recently gone so so and china has not taken any kind of you know responsibility rather it has blamed countries like united states for the spread of virus which is you know which shows that it's not a responsible power and uh, in the final analysis, uh, this is two more slides actually. Uh, uh, basically, looking at uh, you know sort of these triangular relations, U.S., India, and China. Uh, as I said, uh, the hegemonic ambition of China is under uh, President Xi Jinping is very clear, and Belt and Road Initiative is is one of his actually trademark you know sort of tool in which he, China wants to use the, this, this sort of infrastructure projects to exert influence and, you know, create a kind of a new neo-colonialism in Asia, Africa, and, you know, entire, uh, uh, even in part of Europe. Uh, then we have, we, have, we have also seen the kind of a relationship uh, with its neighbor and uh, over South China Sea. Uh, 
but the uh, the presence also it's it has a growing presence in indian indian oceans in which you know china wants to be a sort of dominant player because all year china had no presence in indian ocean and uh, india used to be one of the dominant player in, in indian ocean but that's now uh, increasingly changing and uh, real concern is actually relative decline of us because uh, for all these seven decades us has acted as a security pro- you know sort of uh, provider and it has actually maintained a kind of balance of power in in asia in uh, america in europe and many part actually uh, through its you know uh, military alliances through its economic cooperation and you know playing uh, a larger role through its allies but if you look at uh, the kind of a precarious situation that we are witnessing in terms of you know what japan is doing what uh, philippines is doing what vietnam is doing they are looking for other uh, you know partners even what us actually has done in terms of you know trump administration by pulling out from many of the global institutions and uh, coining the word america first is a is, is a admission that it, it 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 it's no longer wants to be the global player that it used to be for last 70 years it's probably more bothered about its domestic uh, you know sort of compulsion so that is actually facilitating china's easy rise and unchecked kind of you know growth in many ways so so you don't have a kind of us which can uh, stop china that used to do you know for several decades and then there is of course there is a military and economic asymmetry between china and india because the 30 years back it was a different scenario today the china is five times bigger economy than india you know 30 years back they were on the same you know sort of uh, uh, almost equal and then military power also has dramatically increased and this is also creating a kind of regional sort of asymmetry and i would say uh, insecurity within indo pacific regions and finally Uh, uh to look at i would i, I think uh, confrontation in, uh, and uh, the kind of cooperation that is building of uh, you know can play uh, to certain extent but you can't actually straight away keep china and box it in a uh, like a small country it's a big power it's a second uh, largest economy and it's soon probably going to be the uh, largest economy in the world so you can't actually just simply dismiss it and you know uh, corner it because there will be many country which would go to china for capital for uh, uh, investment for technology uh, so i'm saying Uh, this is largely going to be a sort of uh, you know us china india relationship is going to be a sort of uh, largely a strategic triangle in which there will be you know a lot of interdependence because you will have to have uh, cooperation on trade on security issues on climate change on global governance these three countries have to co- cooperate there is no other way you can actually you can't escape it how much we actually talk about china as you know atmanirbhar and all that can we actually stop uh, chinese you know uh, sort of uh, business with chinese we have almost doing 100 billion you know sort of uh, business with china and uh, and that has grown actually uh, you know exponentially in last uh, several years so you can cut cut that down for our own you know sustenance and growth similarly us is also largest uh, sort of a with with china and uh, almost uh, touching 7 800 uh, billion uh, you know sort of trade so can they actually stop that so it it won't be so obviously there will be huge interdependence but then conflict scenario cannot be also denied because uh, rise of china Uh, as a hegemonic power uh, is uh, bringing lot of activities you know like in terms of uh, what you are uh, seeing depending uh, defense cooperation between us and uh, india is a classic uh, example of that because much of this cooperation happening and us is more than willing to support india is largely because of china's uh, you know astonishing rise and us simply also knows that it cannot actually be the uh, main anchor in terms of you know checking china it needs allies like you know uh, india and uh, japan australia several you know powers in the asia region and then quadrilateral you know that quad thing that uh, democracy alliance between us japan uh, australia and india is also a, a sort of a, a clear clear example uh, so so that is also one way to contain china and check it actually so that its ambition its hegemony is contained to some extent Uh, and and if you today look at it uh, this relationship uh, between uh, india and uh, china is not a zero sum game it's uh, not even the chicken game uh, or uh, what whatever you call it it's a sort of mutual existence and sustenance but uh, at some point or other one has to also figure out the strategic and security other concerns are also handled so i see actually a sort of increasing uh, and very very robust relationship between us and india vis a vis china 
but that is also not going to be in a zero sum game mode it is going to be you know uh, sort of uh, confrontation and cooperation in uh, and and it's, it's a very dynamic field it, it is going to uh, continue to change uh, you know with, with time but i see uh, the enduring kind of relationship between the united states and uh, india thank you thank you thank you dr sam for the detailed and very extensive presentation on the international economic relation of usa with india china and its also history of uh, in the relation of usa with india china and uh, including pakistan afghanistan and, and other countries so already we are running out of time so there are a number of questions raised by the participants due to registration i have summarized these questions into several blocks and these are related to india asia usa and global economy let me invite dr badri first to address the questions related to economics then i will invite dr sao okay so the first question that is as you mentioned about rcep also director statement about rcep so the question that as you know that that india already you have discussed that uh, india has opted out of rcep because of expectation that the influx of manufacturing and electronic imports from china and dairy products from australia and new zealand would harm the domestic producing producers well so what's your take on on the harmful effect or benefit of opting out of uh, rcep so what's your views yeah uh, thank you kumarik and, and i also thank dr saho for a very insightful uh, presentation um, uh, on the rcep question uh, the uh, it's a very uh, uh, complex issue but um, broadly speaking the uh in in the short term uh it, it would be a relief for india because the um, uh, definitely the sectors you mentioned like uh, many many exports many different commodities exported from china and uh, dairy dairy products in particular and some other products from australia and new zealand uh, they can flood the indian market if uh, rcep was done immediately then that would affect the Uh, farmers and manufacturers and so on uh but having said that i also feel that uh this is always the case whenever we have a, we go with a trade deal uh, there is going to be we cannot we cannot just uh, you know export to countries without importing right so we always we want, like almost every country in the world they want to be part of a trade deal because they are getting a new market to export to uh, but we also had to Uh, uh understand that all the partners also want the same so if you if if india wants to export to other countries the other countries also want to export to india so then the idea is to negotiate until the most sensitive things are taken care of and i i think that in rcep there was a possibility to uh, uh, do that but we i i feel like we we uh, kind of missed the bus because we haven't we did not negotiate um, very uh kind of scientifically like showing a lot of evidence and saying that these are the sensitive sectors these are not we have to uh, and we need more access to the services trade because services trade was not uh, touched much in rcep and that was a big um, you know difficulty for india and these things uh, probably india could have taken an early leadership in rcep and uh, brought in a lot of this uh, very i mean the reasons why india stepped out of rcep they have been very clearly articulated by the government and they are they are all very genuine reasons but the problem is that this should have been raised um, from the beginning and discussed because the purpose of any trade negotiation is to uh, work out all these uh, differences uh, and come up with a plan that can benefit all the countries uh, including india so uh, i what i feel is like in the long term uh, in both in economic aspect and in in uh, strategic geopolitical aspect uh, probably india has uh, uh, is probably going to face some losses because of not joining in also the reason the economic reason is that uh, we need this uh, import competition like uh, without opening up the domestic market is not going to be efficient and productive uh, so uh, currently uh, we have closed uh, we have managed to uh, you know protect the domestic industry from Uh, uh competition from china and others but that also is going to mean that this domestic industries uh, are going to stay uh, inefficient and uh, for for a long time to come so that 
opportunity to increase efficiency productivity that is lost that is economic reason and uh, that may not be a huge thing but definitely something to consider but more importantly in geopolitical aspects and uh, strategic aspects uh, india has uh, very unfortunately india is not part of any major global block so trans pacific partnership was the first you know big uh, trade uh, agreement uh, which was actually you know led by us but ironically us itself stepped down um under trump administration uh, then there were uh, other other many other agreements like trans uh, atlantic trade and investment partnership between us and eu and uh, several in asia apec and uh, asean plus uh, many many trade agreements and rcep was supposed to be the largest uh, you know trade agreement with india and china both were well, the only non wto trade agreement where both india and china were part of so uh, india lost that opportunity to be part of that block being part of a trading block is go, uh, would have given india access to a lot of uh, you know uh, uh, information exchange and also uh, collaboration within the block which is important for uh, india's trade trade relations also so i think that that uh, that way it's bad so uh, what i would say is uh, like i have done uh, different studies on this and some studies i focus on the short term implications and they are definitely um uh, uh, you know joining rcep immediately would have a negative impact immediately uh, and uh, but in the longer term uh, rcep would have been positive for india so uh, from a visionary point of view we could have joined rcep uh, by taking into account the losers some people are going to lose so the the critical thing of any trade agreement the success of any trade agreement lies with how you protect the losers if we know some people are going to lose how are you going to support them how are you going to rehabilitate them so that if that part was done uh, it would have been great uh, so that's my uh, you know take about us so hope hope that was uh, clear yeah thank you now the question on the chinese e currency that is uh, you know that china is bringing new e currency that is digital yuan so how do you think it will uh, it will affect their competitiveness and also do you think it will affect to the economy of usa and india and the world economies what should take on that on e currency yeah, a very uh, nice question and you know, it's it's a very uh, relevant uh, development I, i've been following that as well um there are two, uh, few aspects here one is um, the success of this uh, digital currency even within china which is you know it's already happening china chinese are following it anyway they're all using it Uh, particularly chinese exporters uh, the success and and then it's going to be uh, propagated to other countries so the success of it is directly going to affect dollar so dollar dollar as a globally uh, used currency might be affected because of this so that is one big uh, issue uh, for the whole world particularly for the us uh, second aspect is that uh, it's a smart way to Uh, kind of subsidize the exporters because in under wto you cannot have a lot of export subsidies actually india has been a major uh, i mean both india and china have been violating a lot of export subsidies and recently india has been under fire like us has sanctioned a lot against india about textile industry pharmaceutical industry electronics industry about subsidies uh, so now this is a smart way of uh, subsidizing because uh, through the digital currency um based on the you know the 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 control that the chinese government has on the currency uh, they can um, subsidize the exporters uh, so that is another another aspect um and the third aspect is also like a genuine uh, boost to competitiveness because the transactions are going to be way easier um and uh, and more transparent uh so in that sense the, the the corruption and inefficiencies in trade uh facilitation those aspects may go away so it is going to be much easier to trade with china because of this so i think these three are the broad uh, uh, uh implications of the, the chinese digital currency sovereign digital currency and i think uh, probably india has taken uh, cognizance of that and right now currently just two days ago i saw that uh, a bill on cryptocurrency uh regulation ban and regulation has been introduced in the parliament for the current uh, budget session so i i have i'm yet to see the details but i i from a broad review i feel like 
they are trying to like RBI might do something similar. India may have a digital sovereign currency, and uh, and in India might also ban the other currencies, including the, the Chinese digital sovereign currency. So I think maybe India is taking some step in this direction, and uh, US is also considering uh, this very seriously. And uh, so yeah, this is a this is a very important aspect of the this triangular relationship and also the whole world. Well, well. So uh, that is a question on shifting of farms from China to the other countries. Also, you also mentioned in your presentation that uh, it is uh, so. How how India is successful in attracting these farms into its territory into India and. Uh, of what what india can do to attract these farms from china and from china into india so i think there are a few uh, different issues here um, uh, the first thing is uh, uh, of course recently uh, india has uh, climbed up in the rankings in terms of doing business indicators and so on investment climate and so on uh, but in many uh, instances we don't see that um, in the ground uh, ground reality because uh, the uh, you know the, the, there are some of the new reforms like you know gst and uh, and, and and also uh, and also implementation of uh, many of the the investment uh, friendly policies and so on uh, they have not been uh, complete basically so gst for many, in many cases uh, has been a hassle for many uh, small and medium enterprises, uh, and and even for the larger uh, companies also, uh, the compliance has been an issue. But I think by now uh, that is not a major issue. Uh, I think uh, particularly the larger companies are uh, you know getting accustomed to that, but the smaller and medium enterprises are going to still uh, be affected. Uh, but this the different the other thing is the certainty of regulations, stability, stability of regulations, and so on, and law and order uh, situation. Where uh, you know one major thing, like even a lot of NRIs who live will live here and people who live abroad, many of them, when we talk about going back to India, one thing many many people worry about is about the 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 implementation of uh, law law and order regulations and so on. So we have very good system. Like India has one of the best uh, legal systems, frameworks, policy systems, and so on. But when it comes to implementation, uh, for example, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 property rights, property rights enforcement, and so on, uh, there are a lot of uh, difficulties. And also, uh, with respect to the tax policies, there are a lot of uh, these retro, retro, uh, retrospective taxes and so on, which affected a lot of foreign direct investment. So, if you take all these things together, investment policy, tax policy, regulations. Um, and uh, property rights in enforcement, law and order enforcement, and all these things. Uh, the, the, these things are not still not that conducive for uh, many foreign companies to come here. This is one aspect. Another aspect is uh, R&D. So India still, uh, I mean, a lot of us think that when we think of China, we think of cheap exports, and we think of uh, you know uh, uh, labor that is not well treated and exploited and so on. But this is uh, this is history. This is like uh, the 80s or 90s China. Today's China is highly innovative. They have their R&D is uh, no uh, second. It's uh, not second to any major developed country. They have so much investments and expenditures on R&D, and they have very specialized uh, high tech uh, manufacturing and so on. So we are actually not. Uh, we are actually talking about some uh, country that is highly advanced and. And, and replacing that is not not that easy. Like Dr. Saho also mentioned, um, it's it's not a you know uh, 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 kind of a zero sum game to begin with. Like we, we have to uh, learn to live with each other. We are big countries, but even otherwise, uh, even if you want to uh, get into zero sum and if you want to replace, you know, we are not in a position to do that uh, because uh, we uh, uh, R&D expenditure is really low. Innovation and research is low. Particularly applied research. I mean, we may be doing some fundamental research. Even there, we're not that leading. But when it comes to applied uh, uh, research that uh, can be uh, directly uh, implemented in the industry, that is that is also lagging. And there are other things, uh, some reforms that are happening now. Uh, last year, some of the reforms that have been introduced. Hopefully, they may improve uh, the situation. 
when it comes to uh, you know labor and uh, food sector and so on but when it comes to um, why like these are all the reasons why we are not able to attract uh, so much investment away from china here uh, but there, having said all this uh, i don't want to look too pessimistic that their things are improving and uh, we do see uh, for example some of the apple you uh, know smartphones some of the electronic companies they have been relocating to india uh, to a large extent uh, and 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 some of these things are happening but i think we have to be much more uh, proactive uh, both in terms of developing our fundamental aspects like we have to grow a lot as a, as a industry both in, i'm not only saying that it's a government that has to do even industries industries also have to change their mindset they have to become more r and d intensive and innovative and so on and uh, they have to make use of a lot of challenges we are facing today with covid and come up with innovative solutions and that way they can progress i think uh, that that has to be there and the government also has to uh, come up with uh, steps to foster that incentives for r and d and uh, and some of these reforms that are to be implement, implemented and a lot of policies are on paper but they have to you know be implement, implemented properly on uh, on the on the ground and uh, some of the reforms that have been uh, introduced they also have to be um, you know implemented properly and there should be more communication between the government and people and industries uh, so i think if we, if all these things are done uh, then then we may be able to attract more investment from from other countries so i think uh, uh, particularly from china so uh, but but one big positive thing is that uh, like again like dr sahu mentioned he, india is a you know democracy and in many for many countries if uh, uh, like forgetting about business and economy if they want to choose between india and china many countries many people across the world they like india better than china because india is a democracy it's more transparent um, and uh, uh, it's more kind of predictable reliable and so on compared to china so that image is still there and many people if i if i talk to american industrialists for example Uh, they really get frustrated they say oh we really want to go to india but india is not friendly enough for us we want to go there but it's not uh, it's not there yet so uh, so i think once we fix all these policy issues and uh, if the industry also cooperates uh, then then we can attract lot more investment we have huge potential compared to the small countries uh, in south east asia we are much we have much bigger potential to attract investments thank you thank you for the answer the response So now there is a question on the changing administration in US. That is the question that what kind of changes that we may expect with Joe Biden and Kamala Harris as new term, new team of US administration, whose campaigns are America United and America is back. Specifically, how trade and business are going to be affected and which sectors are going to be affected most in India. So what's your take on response? Yeah, right. Uh, i think uh, uh, one uh, major thing is um, uh, like uh, the, the like uh, again dr sau mentioned over time the us india partnership has become almost bipartisan so irrespective of which party is in the power in both countries uh, the us india partnership is going to stay because of the democratic values and because of other you know shared uh, prosperity related aspects so now with biden